Hey y'all, welcome to Scary Tales. I got a great story for you today. It's probably one of my all-time favorite uh, Bigfoot stories. Um, some of you might have heard of it, the Albert Osman incident. Um, this is a, a great story, so kick back, relax, get yourself something cold to drink. I hope you're comfortable. I hope you enjoy this story. Sightings and public interest in Bigfoot began in the late 1960s. Accounts can be found throughout history. Perhaps one of the most intriguing occurred almost a hundred years ago in British Columbia in Canada in 1924. When a prospector, Albert Ostman, Ostman sorry about that, he claimed not only an encounter with such a legendary creature at the time when their existence was not nearly as prevalent in the collective psyche as it is now, but a case of abduction and being held captive for almost a week. And what's more, the case didn't merely in involve one such creature, but an entire family of them. What is particularly interesting about Ostman's account, despite waiting over 30 years to divulge it to the province newspaper in 1957, is that his descriptions matched perfectly with many similar reports that are still happening today, as well as the, res the research of cryptozoologists who have studied this creature and the sightings extensively. While, uh, while it is certainly an outlandish tale, uh, it is perhaps one of the more credible than many skeptics would have us believe. Much of the greater detail of the account comes from personal interviews with Ostman by researcher and author John Green in his book, The Apes Among Us. Although the exact dates are uncertain, at some point in the winter and uh, summer of 1924, uh, prospector Albert Ostman was preparing to venture out into the wilderness of Toba Inlet. In search of the supposed lost gold mine in the area, uh, with him, he had a guide from one of the region's native tribes. As this guide led him into forested regions of the area, he would share with him several of the legends of the lost gold. He would also inform him of the legends of the Sasquatch. In fact, according to some of the legends, many of the prospectors also looking for gold in the area have been killed by these apparently beastly creatures. Wow, some of which were over eight feet tall. Osman, however, he dismissed such wild tales as pure fantasy, or at least tales of a beast from a thousand years ago. <clears throat> he fully intended on heaping deep, heading deep into the brutal wilderness. His guide, however, would only take him so far. He would state that there are many left and they still exist oh man he would have I would be worried to death about that if I had a guide telling me that it's been experienced guide he would arrange to return for Osman in 18 days the prospector then set out on his own eventually setting up a base camp in a quiet location with him he carried his sleeping bag and a cover sheet to make a makeshift tent a 30 caliber rifle and ammunition, and a small holdall of basic food rations. He fully intended on hunting his food during his time in the quiet reaches of the area. As it would turn out, though, however, Osman, he would become the hunted. Hmm. Upon waking one morning, Osman noticed that uh, something that had seemingly gone through all his possessions. There was, however, nothing stolen. He had the feeling that whoever it was, um, this search was seemingly one of curiosity as opposed to intending to steal. Uh, this happened again the following two evenings. Alerting Osman to the fact that someone or something was seemingly stalking him. <clears throat> when he fell asleep on his third evening of strange activity after trying to keep himself awake, things would take a dramatic and life-changing turn. 
he would awaken to find himself being scooped up in his sleeping bag by something large and strong. Osman, despite his dismissing of the guide's accounts and despite not being able to get a proper look at his abductor, knew that it was a Sasquatch. And it was almost certain that this creature was responsible for ransacking his rations during the evening. Although he wasn't certain, he, he estimated that he was carried by this creature uh, for around three hours. And then in a small clearing, he was suddenly dropped to the ground. He remained inside the sleeping bag until morning, too afraid to move. The following morning, he would peer out of his sleeping bag to find himself surrounded by cliffs in a small clearing among the trees. He could also see that there were others around him. He left the sleeping bag completely to finally inspect where he was. To his amazement, as well as the Sasquatch that had carried him, there were three other such creatures. He would recall years later that they looked like a family, an old man, an old lady, and two young ones. He would further go on to recall that the two young Sasquatches seemed to be scared of me, while the old lady did not seem too pleased by his presence. Even more bizarre, he would claim that the Sasquatch who had carried him was waving his arms and telling them what he had in mind. According to Osman, this display caused the other three members of the family to move away from him. Although he was at first scared and startled by the incident, startled by the incident, Osman would observe the strange creatures from the spot where he was left. Um, there he, he, he was at a safe distance from him but it was clear that the male was keeping a watch on him. As he was carried to the location inside his sleeping bag, he had several of his possessions with him. Among those was uh, water and some food rations. He also had his water canister, which he managed to refill at a small spring nearby. When he returned to the spot he had been sitting, he noticed one of the young Sasquatch looking at his possessions. He also noticed what was essentially the family's home in a shelf in the mountainside with an overhanging rock. He even managed to see inside a little way, noticing there was dry moss on the floor of the cave as well, and some kind of blankets woven of narrow strips of cedar bark. Several days went by with little of consequence taking place. He would fill his water canister in the spring, and he would eat the food he had with him. Ostman, no Ostman noticed that the two younger Sasquatches appeared particularly interested in him when he ate, and seemingly what he ate. He would take an empty can of snuff tobacco from his supplies so that the two young Sas Sasquatches could see it. He then tossed it over to where they stood. One of them who Osman would recall later was male, reached for it straight away and began ex examining it. He would eventually take it to the older male and eventually manage to open it. Fascinated, they chatted between themselves for the rest of the evening. By the following morning, however, his dwindling food supplies forced him to put in an action, uh, uh, an escape plan into action. At first, he simply packed up his possessions and set out to leave. However, the large male Sasquatch wasn't having any of it. He immediately blocked his path. He would at one point push the prospector in his chest. Wow, that, that probably hurt too. He would further recall that the Sasquatch appeared to be talking to him or issuing orders of some kind. The word he would state sounded like, Soka, Soka. Whatever the word might have meant, if indeed it was an example of Sasquatch language, Osman understood completely what the creature wanted, and he returned to the area he had spent the last several days. He contemplated simply shooting the creature, but with the limited ammunition, uh, he only had six shells with him. He thought better of it. 
He did, though, begin to put a plan in motion as his thoughts returned to the several cans of snuff he had left. <clears throat> he, would, he would recall years later that a friend of his had saved himself from a mad bull by blinding him with the snuff tobacco. Not convinced he could get close enough to that himself, he decided to use the apparent interest in it to his advantage. When the young Sasquatch approached later, he tossed over the can of snuff once more. This time, however, it wasn't empty. Once more, the younger Sasquatch took the can to the older male, and once more they spent considerable time being fascinated with it. This time they tasted the contents of the can and appeared to enjoy them. During the course of the day, he would present several gifts to the younger Sasquatch, who would take them and examine them before returning and appearing to ask for something else. He would eventually point to a can of snuff. Osman had the impression he was asking for it to give to the older Sasquatch. The prospector would recall how he shook his head and attempted to tell the youngster to bring the older male to him. He wasn't sure if he understood or not and watched as the young male Sasquatch returned to his siblings. Later on, though, the older Sasquatch approached Osman, and his focus of attention was on that can of snuff. Sensing the closeness of his opportunity, Osman reached for it before the Sasquatch could. He did, though, offer the can to the creature who did exactly as Osman had hoped, and he tipped the entire contents of the can into its mouth. Osman watched, hoping that the substance in such large measures would kill the Sasquatch, or at least incapacitate him, for long enough to allow him to make a run for it. Several moments later, it was obvious that the latter was taking place. The Sasquatch then made his way towards the spring, obviously looking for water. As this was happening, Osman quickly gathered what he could of his possessions and left the area. He noticed that the female Sasquatch was now heading towards him. He fired a shot from his rifle into the air, looking to startle it, which it did. And as the female Squatch ran to take cover, scared of the sound that had just rang out, Osman turned and ran. The prospector would check behind him periodically, but none of the Sasquatches were following. <clears throat> he would continue on through the wilderness until he came across a logger working nearby. Thank God, I bet he was, he was thinking. Deciding not to tell them of the encounter with the Sasquatch. He instead asked for help, claiming that he was a prospector who was lost. He would remain at the camp in the logging neighborhood for the evening, then the following day he would board a Union boat that left from nearby, taking him back to the city of Vancouver. Coover. <laughs> Vancouver. He would speak of the incident, he would not speak of this incident until 1957. And only then, when other Bigfoot reports were beginning to surface in the regional and national press. It uh, probably goes without saying that many remain doubtful of Osman's account, who later died in 1975. There are, however, an equal number of researchers, researchers who find it credible and potentially important. We have examined many other Bigfoot and Sasquatch legends before. Are they of the same creature? Is there an unknown creature that lives in the wilderness of such areas? Um, do they reside in these places permanently, or might they move from place to place? And just what, what might these creatures be? For example, example, there appear to be obvious signs of intelligence and an apparent importance of a basic family unit. And if we accept Osman's account as true for a moment, how much might we have learned from observing and interacting with them if conditions were different? It is interesting that the descriptions Osman would give match with contemporary accounts, and sightings still occur in this region today. Whether we should accept Osman's account is, a, is obviously open to debate. Some will, some won't. 
However, he had little to gain from keeping the incident to himself for over three decades before deciding to speak. We will probably never know if the incident he revealed was the product of his imagination or a genuine ordeal. That some strange creature exists in the forest mountain terrains of the North American continent is sure, surely something worthy of continued and very serious study. Thank you guys for listening to that story, and I hope you enjoyed it. I love that story. Like I said, it's my favorite of all Bigfoot stories. Um, it's it's an older one. It's just stuck around, and uh, it just gets it better every time I hear it. It still gives me the goosebumps, man. But uh, thank you for coming this back to Scary Tales, and um, come back again in the near future and, and uh, listen to another story. I appreciate you. Y'all take care.